Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Thank you for uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk here. It's very it's very nice. I really enjoyed the workshop. Now it's Friday morning, so a little bit of last effort for the week. Um, so the workshop workshop is about dynamos in planets and stars. Uh, I will talk a bit of both, trying to make a connection towards the end of my talk. I hope I will be on time. Um, and so the talk is divided into two parts. First part is about uh, stability problem that we mm, designed to study stability of magnetic fields in stars, but maybe apply also for planets, we'll see. While the second part uh, is a simple analytical model of of stellar dynamos and it's some way that two different really uh, piece of work but they might be connected this work was was done with a number of people especially with uh, guillermo monteiro and uh, gustavo guerrero from uh, Univers universidad um, federal de minas gerais in Belo Horizonte, in brazil and Archie bonanno in uh, enough uh, catania in italy and uh, it was great to work with them, and this is still work in progress. Especially, you will see the second part of this unstable stellar magnetic fields. So the motivation, um, I will not show the, mot the observational motivation we saw a lot during this week, and I'm not the best person to talk about observational motivations, but yesterday we talked a bit about concentrating on some effects, like uh, the role of stratification, the role of gravity, uh, and the role of rotation for dynamos. Here we study uh, the role of these effects for an instability that may may trigger a dynamo. May we, we don't know. We don't know yet. And then the second part I also talked about concentrate on boundary conditions that to me are uh, play a quite important role, especially well for both stellar and planetary dynamos, but maybe especially for stellar dynamos. There's a lot of another number of long number of effects that I'm not taking into account here. So we um, the setup I'm going to describe starts from a, an unstable toroidal field. We know the stars, planets, everything rotates, so it's conceivable to believe that there are there is a big part of toroidal fields, and they might go unstable. This is the stability of toroidal fields is called. Uh, Taylor instability is known as Taylor instability. So we choose a profile of a purely toroidal field uh, in an isothermal and stably stratified environment uh, with these boundaries, perfect conductor for uh, magnetic fields and impermeable for, um, for velocity and no flux, no thermal flux outside the boundary. So it's a very specific choice of boundaries. And um, we concentrate on the role of these two frequencies, brun basala frequencies and uh, alpha band frequency. And we basically study the ratio between the two that we call delta. And these are uh, different realizations of the profile, of the radial profile uh, of delta, depending on uh, the gravity. So we change in the first part of our study, we change the value of gravity in uh, our um, our spheres. All the simulations that I'm going to show are uh, performed with the uh, EULAG uh, MHD code. Uh, well, the usual equations, more or less, because we have an elastic approximation. So yesterday, again, we talked about difference between DNS and elastic approximation. So all I'm, all I'm going to show is in the analytic approximation. Uh, we use a potential temperature for uh, the energy equation. So, and we evolve basically the perturbations of, uh, of temperature and uh, on, on uh, background profile. And these are implicit large eddy simulations. So the goal is to maximize Reynolds numbers, but for the aficionados of Reynolds number, uh, I'm not going to show any number here because of course, when you have um, no physical um, dissipation in the code, you cannot really evaluate it so easily. Um, so this is, of course, one of the limitations when using 
uh, ideal MHD codes, um, but it's okay. Uh, we, we want to make sure that the physics is, is out there and we will uh, verify it with simulations. So this is a typical example of our simulation. So this is the meridional section of the domain. And this is the time evolution of the modes, of the azimuthal modes, the m equal zero, m equal one, m equal two. So we see that uh, our um, toroidal field goes unstable after a certain time. The old mode seems to grow here, but the m equal one is growing faster. And this, is, this seems to be a signature of um, Taylor instability. So these first simulations were just performed to verify that actually we can reproduce the Taylor instability in, uh, in this setup and with these tools. And then, of course, we start changing the parameters. Uh, I talked about the role of magnetic fields and the initial strength, and we see that keeping the gravity constant, but changing the initial strength of the magnetic field, we see different behavior. Um, so in this case, you see that the, the, the field configuration is stable for a bit longer. We will see in detail later. We also see the occurrence of these uh, radial modes uh, when the gravity is increased up to a certain value. And this is also some way expected from, for the Taylor instability. Please start noting that um, we ran the simulations for a quite a long Alphen travel, well, quite a long time in terms of Alphen travel times. So in principle, after a few Alphen travel times, all should be there because the magnetic perturbations propagate but uh, we want to see also what happens at later stages. This is another way to, to see, uh, mm, to visualize the simulation, just to, to explain a bit better what's going on. So here we see the poloidal field, the evolution of the poloidal field in the first column. And you see that something starts from the poles. Uh, and this is also some way expected because uh, the part near the pole, the, near the axis, uh, is some way the most unstable for the Taylor instability. The toroidal field, uh, yeah, goes unstable, and of course, at the end, is turbulent field basically. And here we, yeah, we see a um, counter plot of toroidal field again. And of course, I'm Italian, so I like to do this uh, visualization for uh, spaghetti-like uh, things and. Uh, uh, we see that everything goes crazy towards the end, while at the beginning is quite well ordered. And here, instead, we can uh, we can see the evolution a uh, bit more in detail of this of all the modes. Or again, for different cases, uh, we have six different realizations here of the initial strength of the field, and for each of them, we show three different values of gravity. So we see first of all that when gravity is increased the growth rate in the linear phase here uh, decreases a lot. This is the m equal one and m equal two mode. Uh, and we can clearly see that when the field strength uh, decreases, then the growth rate also decreases. This is also expected. Um, but uh, I think that this is, I don't know if one of the first times that is done with uh, non elastic code and for this uh, field configuration and stable stratified environment. Then we can uh, quantify the growth rate uh, and see if there is some, some behavior because the goal is, the ultimate goal is also to see whether or not gravity can stabilize exactly this, uh, this instability. So here we uh, see how the growth rate behaves in terms of uh, the radius. So we see that actually it changes a bit for some models, uh, it's kind of constant, while for other models, uh, there are quite clear changes. So there are some parts of the field that goes unstable and faster than uh, other areas. While uh, here we have a global behavior, uh, this is just dependence on uh, gravity. And we see that there are basically two branches. And the second part, when gravity is increased a lot, um, we, we almost get the suppression of the instability, 
almost, but the, the field goes unstable in the end. Um, so we cannot really conclude that the gravity completely stabilizes the field, can completely stabilize the field, um, at least in the parameter space we explore. But we can also, we cannot exclude that this is due to some sort of um, limitation of our numerical model, because um, one possible limitation is that at the beginning, we don't have a real ground state. So we don't have a, a MHD balance, um, but this is reached at some point during the simulation. But this also means that there are perturbances that can be, can perturb the field enough to get it unstable. And here it's a more complete picture uh, where we add to this point here, also different um, cases with uh, different magnetic field. And, um, and we see here, for instance, that in this case, we get um, that the growth rate do, almost do not change when increasing uh, delta, so increasing uh, the gravity. Good news in this plot is that we have these four stars here, uh, actually five, that are uh, simulations performed with um, double of the resolution. And so we see a convergence, um, at least in terms of growth rate. This is good news because this means that what we are seeing exactly, we have a proof that does not depend on the resolution, which may always be a problem. Then we add to this uh, picture, we add rotation. Uh, we change a bit um, the stratification. So here we concentrate on a thinner layer that resembles the upper uh, part of the uh, solar radiative zone. While before we were in a stably stratified atmosphere that may also resemble actually planetary atmospheres, maybe. So it's a general case. Um, and again, uh, we see that uh, at some point, similar behavior, just, just put different features because they are related to different simulations. And again, we see that the, the evolution is this here, we have 300 of fan travel times. So it's really long, long-term evolution we are, we are seeing here. And this is the growth of the M equal one modes for uh, different cases uh, where we change the rotation from uh, no rotating case, so this purely linear one, uh, to the slow rotation. So the red one is 300 days of rotation. And then down to 10 days of rotation. So in the 10 days, we see that basically the first part for the first 30 of fan travel times sees basically no growth of, of the M equal one mode, which should be enough to say that this is stable uh, so means that such a rotation can stabilize the field. Nonetheless, at some point, we see this jump here. Uh, and just long story short, this is still an open question for us. That's why the paper has not, was not submitted so far. My personal guess, I don't know if even my co-authors agree with me because we are debating this in this day, but that there might be, uh, so here we have a solid body rotation uh, forced on the domain. However, at some point, the code, well, does what the code can do, but at some point there are some departures from solid body rotation and uh, there is some shear uh, taking place in, in some areas of the domain, especially near the poles. And then, so some sort of second uh, kind of instability may play a role here and might be responsible for this quick growth of of the M equal one mode and of all the modes actually. Uh, here we have um, this much more complex uh, plot, but we have M equal one, M equal two, M, M equal zero, M equal one and two. And a three different parts of the domain. Um, so North Pole, South Pole and the equatorial area. We see that the growth, this instability, shows up mainly first near the poles. And also it's much more complicated to identify a linear phase of the instability, which uh, of course uh, causes some doubts on what 
on which kind of instability we are seeing, because for tailored instability, we should see the M equal one mode growing faster than others. Mm. An important point is that on the long run, we see, and this is maybe the, maybe the, the most important outcome of this work, that we see, we see the development of toroidal, poroidal field. And here we are plotting the poroidal component in terms of uh, the azimuthal component, the toroidal component. And we see that for most of the simulations, uh, at very late, late stages, we have um, like 0.3 more or less of the toroidal, of the toroidal field um, is made by the toroidal field. While for uh, the non-rotating cases, uh, so these are two different non-rotating cases, the black ones, and slow rotating cases, the red uh, dashed and uh, a continuous red line. So this value changes, it's, it's different. So this indicates that when the system is rotating is really something different is happening, but the final configuration, which is stable for a long time and actually, uh, in principle may even allow us to to evaluate the uh, turbulent diffusion of the in in the in the domain um so it's really stable and there is a this constant more or less value between the poloidal and toroidal field so when i'm talking about this phase is beyond here so this is already late non-linear phase and it's just decaying here the field is then just decaying Also, and the last point here on this part is that uh, this instability can develop, can lead to development of, of uh, turbulence, at least in the azimuthal modes, both uh, without rotation. Here we see the kinetic and, uh, and magnetic energy at the beginning and then at the end of the simulation. And the same here for, uh, uh, this is just magnetic energy uh, at the beginning and at the end of the simulation. This mode, uh, really grow uh, one by one at some point. And at the beginning, there is the M equal one growing and then all the other modes pop up. So in the azimuthal mode, we see, uh, we see the development of turbulence. Uh, I also talked with Lorraine, uh, who said in, uh, in her talk that uh, in radiative zones, we should not be worried about turbulence in the sense that uh, we should not be worried about turbulence as we are when we deal with um, uh, with convection, but still we can see, I mean, still these are turbulent environments. So the, out, the take home messages from this is that uh, the gravity can uh, make the field more stable, although we do not see a complete stabilization of, of the field. The in initial intensity of the field plays also a role. Uh, while rotation, we, we believe really stabilizes the tailored instability. Uh, beyond a certain threshold. And whenever the field goes unstable, a small poloidal field is developed in the final configuration that then can be stable for, a, for long times. Here, just a bridge between the first and the second part. The, so the Taylor instability is something that uh, leads to symmetry breaking. So this is a picture of, a, when we want to see the system sense of a dynamical system, dynamical system, we see the plot of uh, elicity versus energy. And there are some uh, attractors uh, here that, be, um, that corresponds to the presence of elicity helical states with two different signs. While uh, zero helical states are, uh, are not really stable, are like saddle point, like this S4 here. This is a previous study we did in 2012. And, uh, so this means that we see the development of turbulence, we see the development of, um, uh, of elicity, and we cannot exclude then there is some dynamo at work. And maybe we will talk, we will hear more about this today for in the next talks, I don't know, uh, but still an open question, absolutely. Then move here to the second part of the talk that uh, instead deals with a simple analytical model some way motivated by what we saw and also by observations uh, in the sense that um, for some stars, we can see that even a very idealized model like a 
alpha square uh, mean field dynamo uh, can describe some behavior of the stars we debated also about what are the limits of mean field dynamos but surely mean field dynamo offers some framework to understand what's going on and here we are i'm trying to make a connection also with exoplanets with planets and uh, still uh, again open open question a lot of open questions so, um, i start from saying that there are many factors driving stellar activity that is an observable for uh, the sun and stars uh, and among these of course magnetic fields stellar age stellar structure there may also be the presence of a planetary system that plays a role in terms of may play a role in terms of boundary condition um, and here instead uh, indeed we um, we imagine that the presence of a magnetic uh, magnetized pl planet on a closing orbit around the star um, may affect boundary condition and then may affect stellar dynamo itself so the starting point is an analytical model in the book by Krauss and uh, Radler uh, in the 80s. Um, so alpha squared dynamo idealized homogeneous and isotropic non-mirror symmetric turbulence. So this is really not realizable, but uh, still works sometimes. Uh, so we have the absence of large scale shear and we rely just on the action of small scale turbulence. And we want to see what, uh, how the mean magnetic field evolved. So for this problem, they found this kind of solution for the toroidal and the poloidal component. Here, basically, they, the dynamo condition is that at the boundary, since they, um, for, because of the boundary conditions, they want to have zero toroidal field. But still, this is not what we see in for stars. There are observations of toroidal fields. So we can, have, we can employ the usual toroidal and poloidal decomposition. And we can put a model of coronal field um, outside the domain. So um, for uh, Krauss and Radler, they use the current free model with beta equals zero. Uh, we try to extend this with a beta that may attain some other value, so allowing for the presence of currents in the corona, but still um, in a force free environment. And then we put the second layer outside where we force the presence of a Parker wind, so purely radial field. Then in that case, the, the toroidal uh, component of the field is indeed zero. And the outcome is, is the following. We, we, we plot here uh, this dynamo number, so the eigenvalue solution basically for the, for the, for the equation. Uh, and as function of this C beta, which is proportional to the external radius of the corona and of this, uh, the, of the force free parameter beta. So when beta is equal to zero, we are in the Krauser and uh, Radler case, and these are the dynamo number. But then the dynamo number change um, when beta is negative or positive. And here we see that when the beta is negative, the dynamo number increases a, a bit, while the dynamo numbers decrease uh, when beta is positive. So what, what does it mean? This, this when, when the dynamo number um, uh, increase means that it's a bit more difficult to excite the dynamo, while the opposite is true when they decrease. And so this may lead us to think that some way coronal currents uh, may quench or enhance, or maybe at least uh, have the dynamo more efficient or less efficient, uh, depending on the mutual orientation of the corona, uh, coronal currents with the coronal field. Of course, the picture is, and the topology in real stars is far more complicated than this. There are spots, there are active regions, you name it. Uh, but this, is, this may be a general behavior. And so when we consider the presence of a magnetized planet on a closing orbit uh, in the subalphanic regime, so we, have, we may have that the magnetic fields lines of the planet may connect directly to some way the corona uh, of, of the star. And um, we know that many of the, well, some of the hot Jupiters may be evaporating. So this means that we have a flux of ionized particles that may fall on the star. 
I don't know how big or how small the, this flux may be, but that might be there. And this is a current. And this is a current that it, uh, it falls on the star, uh, is antiparallel in general to the field. And especially, well, this is a idealized picture, but current may fall directly on the active regions, for instance. So we don't know again what's, what's going on here. But uh, matter of fact, in this case, we are in the case of beta negative. And so this may lead to a, some way a subtraction or a decrease of uh, stellar dynamo and then consequently of stellar activity. This is true for alpha omega dynamo, alpha squared dynamos. Uh, again, only analytically speaking, we don't know what's going on in the real case. But surely when we are in beta equal zero, um, we can have lower activity. But if the planet instead is magnetized, but not evaporating, then we are still again in the beta equal zero case. So um, this, I just put this slide to say that matter of fact, it's not enough to see a hot Jupiter and say, okay, we expected the star as, uh, um, uh, lower level of activity because we don't really know the characteristics of the Jupiter in the end. But so we should look for possible uh, observational evidence. Uh, there might be planet induced uh, aurora emission and or uh, low activity for hot, hot Jupiter OS. And this is the case for uh, some observations. So there are some specific cases. One interesting and very Mm, hot topic nowadays is this GJ1151 because it was claimed the discovery of radio or radio emission triggered uh, stellar radio emission triggered by the presence of a planet of a closing planet but then the existence of this closing planet is disputed so this is an, really an open question and the star uh, is also displaying a low level of activity also the first exoplanet uh, ever discovered uh, one of the first around the solar like star, um, 51 Pegasus B, as a, um, as a suppressed activity. And the theories are saying that star may be in under minimum, minimum phase, but again, also claiming that the star is in the under minimum phase, so way not satisfactory to me because we don't know yet how under minimum phases are, uh, are generated. And there are also other cases. So, of course, there are limits uh, for this model. It's quite simplistic, uh, needs to be tested with MHD numerical simulations. Hopefully, uh, we'll do it in the next years uh, as soon as possible. And, um, and also, we don't know whether or not the hot Jupiter is a subalphenic or superalphenic regime. So, this is another open question for many, many exoplanetary systems. But uh, so we were debating uh, also about the di diversity we see in planets and in stars. And so we were saying that planets are way more, mm, offer a wider diversity than stars. I, I agree, but stars then host planetary systems. So the diversity is, I think, much higher than what we believe or we can imagine yet. Um, and that's it. The model may potentially allow to determine the magnetization of a Jupiter along with, along with uh, observations, evaluate the alphenic distances for a, for a, for a hot Jupiter host, and may allow to understand the role of boundary conditions for, a, for stellar dynamo and the role for stellar activity, which in the end is an observable that we should look for. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Fabio. We have questions. So for the first part of your talk where you're talking about the toroidal fields, I, I think you pointed out that your initial state is not an equilibrium, at least in certain cases. Um, have you looked at maybe adding a bit of 
colloidal field and maybe getting a uh, force free or at least um, uh, a, a torque free initial initial state might make things a little bit simpler to try to analyze from the simulation side. Yeah, so uh, let me say that in a previous study of when we started, uh, we concentrated on symmetry breaking, we were in a different geometry and um, cylindrical geometry. And then in that case, we really had uh, ground state with force balance, exactly. Now here it's more complicated. And what we did is, it's not exactly what you said, but more or less it's the same because we put a field that is almost in equilibrium, and then we let it evolve a bit until it reaches the equilibrium. Uh, so since we want to study the stability of purely toroidal fields, we, don't, we cannot put like polar field to, to have an equilibrium, that's the point. And since we want to really evaluate the effects of um, different parameters, we cannot really add shear or rotation or uh, because and so maybe this might be easier when we have like a differential rotation, which is the next step with shear, uh, but then the picture is way more complex. Uh, or we may do a bigger analytical work and then write down some, find some field that is actually can be in, a, in equilibrium. Can you say a little bit more about how you do that initial relaxation into an equilibrium? Yeah, I'll go back. Um, no, really, so, so really, um, you see here, um, this is the non-rotating case. Here, basically, we, have, we do the relaxation like in a few time steps before, so we let it evolve a little bit. But then, matter of fact, as soon as we, so we just let the, the initial field evolve, that, that this is what, what we do. Uh, so there is a development of like, we can call it Gaussian noise or uh, anyway, some small scale velocity fields that stabilizes, but also destabilizes, because then this is the perturbance we, we have here. And then matter of fact, it starts this black line Start, goes unstable immediately. Um, instead, again, in the, in the um, cylindrical case, we really had to add a perturbation, have to add a perturbation with a specific helicity. And then that's how, that's how we could study the symmetry breaking. Depending on the tiny perturbation we put with a tiny amount of helicity, we saw that some certain kind of helicity uh, was uh, developed and then the final state was reached. So mm, there is not much to say about uh, how to let the system evolve. Just we have the, we let the code doing the job for the first time steps, really few time steps. But it's surely uh, something that, uh, how to say, uh, we are safe because we see that the behavior of the instability is what we see, but we cannot, for instance, do with this setup a study of symmetry breaking because we cannot control the perturbation. More questions? Yes. Um, when your poloidal field develops, yes, um, is it very turbulent? Is it fluctuating all the time, or is, is there actually a mean part of it? Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's fluctuating a lot, and uh, if... you see that um, here, for instance, the stability saturates at around uh, 50 or 100 uh, our fan travel times, but when we see the poloidal field, this develops later, so it still fluctuates yeah. and <laughs> oscillates a bit, and also when we see the topology the local topology it's very complex it's right yeah yeah it's not just a well-ordered field absolutely no, no it's not a well-ordered field yeah no absolutely yeah. i just did have another quick question um in your equations you had a sort of tour term in the uh, heat equation didn't you yeah um I just wondered whether you yeah the last term in the heated temperature equation there that's so just, this is that's just a stabilized code, is it? I mean, you, you yeah, didn't mention, so this, this you didn't is, mention uh, anything about tour. I mean, that's not an important parameter. It's not an important parameter. We try to to study also the dependence on the behavior 
according to this parameter. Uh, there is some change, but it's just for stabilization. Yeah, this is a, basically a diffusion term. Right. It's just yeah. basically to stabilize the yeah, 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 it helps to stabilize the system. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We also tried to avoid that, and uh, because you know maybe we may see that that suppress some kind of instability that we want to see, but uh, we checked that uh, things work fine also without this term. Any more questions for Fabio? I was crystal clear, so. <laughs> Okay, and let's thank Fabio again. Thank you.